Hey guys, and welcome to GP Academia. Magnetic resonance imaging is a biomedical imaging modality that uses a large magnet and radio waves to look at organs and structure in our body. It can be used to detect brain tumors, traumatic brain injury, stroke, infection, and other conditions. To understand the physical principle behind this, you should understand the basic physics that includes the atoms, spin, and magnetism. In this lecture, I will give an overview lecture on what is MRI, its signal source, acquisition, and a little bit of its parts. Let's start. This is the outline of this video lecture. We can generally describe an MR imaging procedure as follows. So first, the patient's body is placed in a strong magnetic field and this causes the spin system or primarily the protons present in the patient's body to precess or you can imagine this precess as the movement of a spinning top when it starts to wobble. So next, this one, the second one, a radio frequency wave is transmitted to the body that causes a magnetic resonance. And this is done through an RF coil present in our MR machine. After some period of time, the radio wave is turned off. And during that time, a detector will be used to receive signal from the patient using another RF coil or the same RF coil that we have used earlier. This is this, the one used to reconstruct an MR image. Uh, we can uh, spatial uh, we can do spatial modulation uh, with its magnetic field strength along the horizontal and vertical to detect signals from different locations using region coils. Just like other medical imaging modalities, MRI is non-invasive. It is considered a tomographic imaging modality like CT, SPECT, and PET. It can also be used to observe the physiology, metabolism, and function of the human body through diffusion perfusion MRI or functional MRI. Generally, this is how we acquire image in magnetic resonance imaging. The patient will enter the machine. So this is the machine, this uh, cylindrical uh, thing. Then an MR pulse sequence is chosen, this one which is just a program set of changing magnetic regions. So we have here along the X, along the Y, and along the Z. Each sequence will have a number of parameters and multiple sequences grouped together into an MR protocol. Example is a T1 weighted scan, which, is, or which show tissues with high fat content, such as a white matter of the brain, while a T2 weighted scan, so this is another weighting, uh, those filled with water, such as the cerebrospinal fluid uh, compartments, appear bright in those types of images. Then, uh, we will have this one. A case space will be acquired. and This is just an array of numbers representing spatial frequencies in the MR image. Finally, uh, we can do an inverse Fourier transform using, let's say, a fast Fourier transform to get the final MR image. When discussing MRI, the major components of the MRI are the following. So first, we have the magnet. Uh, second, we have the radio frequency uh, transmitter and receiver. Third, we have a set of gradient coils along the X, along the Y, and the Z. MR scanners are broadly classified into a closed or open bore systems. Majority of the machines are of the closed bore, so the, the first one. Uh, closed bore cylindrical design and generate their fields by passing current through a solenoid kept at superconducting temperature. Next, uh, we have this one open bore magnets, uh, which contain uh, an air gap between two magnetic poles. So that's it. So this is a permanent magnet. Next, uh, there are different uh, types of coils in MR. First, uh, we have the main coil. Uh, which produces the B naught or the magnetic field. We have the shim coil, uh, which improves the homogeneity of the magnetic field. Uh, we have the gradient coil, uh, which is uh, for imaging, and we have three gradient coils for, for this case. 
RF coils uh, transmit B1 field, which is used to manipulate the precession of the magnetization vector, which we will discuss later. Uh, last, we have the patient coil, primarily detect uh, MR signal. So this is the use of this. Nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR, is not about radioactivity. This is the usual notion of people when they hear the word nuclear. Nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR, is about the charge and angular momentum of nuclei. To answer the question what happens when we place the patient into an MR machine, we should understand first the basic characteristic of an atom. We know that atoms consist of nucleus and electron shells where uh, protons are present in the nucleus. This positively charged protons possess a spin. So uh, like little planets, it spins around an axis as illustrated here in my drawing. Well, a spin is actually a quantum mechanical quantity. Considering a hydrogen atom, the nucleus has a spin angular momentum and a magnetic moment. They are related through this constant gamma, this one, in, in this equation, which is the gyromagnetic ratio. In addition, the proton has its own magnetic field and it can be seen as a little bar magnet. So like, like this one with this magnetic uh, field. A nucleus with either an odd uh, atomic number or an odd mass number has an angular momentum called the spin. Other examples of nuclei that can be used for MRI are, are the following. So we have Seq-13 or carbon-13, uh, sodium-23, and oxygen-17. Without the external magnetic field, protons are pointing at different direction, just like this one. When we place protons in a strong external magnetic field, there are two things about the magnetic moments of protons that can be observed. The protons' magnetic moments uh, tend to align with the external magnetic field, as shown here, just like a compass needle in the Earth's magnetic field. However, for the protons, it can be either parallel or anti-parallel. If it is parallel, just like this too, then it is in the low energy state, just like a man walking on his feet, as illustrated here. On the other hand, if we have anti-parallel protons like this one, it is in the high energy state, analogous to a man walking on using one's hands, as which is exhausting, as shown here. The state that needs less energy is preferred, so more protons walking on their feet is present than those walking on their hands. So this is called the spin excess. The spin excess uh, expre or is used to generate the MR signals. Still under the protons in magnetic field, so the protons magnetic moment is induced to rotate around the axis of the magnetic field. This type of movement is called precession. This movement is like a spinning top or a gyroscope as illustrated here in my GIF file. Gravity causes the spinning gyroscope to wobble. In protons precession, the axis of the spinning uh, top circle, so this one, or it forms this top circle uh, which also forms a cone this is usually, or this is actually a very fast moment. But for simplicity, we will have this snapshot of the precession as illustrated here in my drawing. The speed can be measured as the precession frequency, or this is how many times the proton presses per second. And this is expressed by this equation. The precession angular speed, or omega naught, is proportional to the external magnetic field B naught. And we have this proportionality constant, which is called the gyromagnetic ratio. This equation is called the Larmor frequency. And uh, we can also write it in terms of the frequency F0 as illustrated here. It can be seen in this equation that the higher the magnetic field strength, the higher the precession frequency becomes. But why is precession frequency important? It has something to do with the resonance part in the MRI. From here on, we will present protons as vectors. 
each proton magnetization can be considered as vector as illustrated here in my drawing. Now, let us consider my drawing. I have here five protons pointing up, processing parallel to the external magnetic field line along the Z direction. So, we have here the B0 and two protons pointing down, processing anti-parallel to the magnetic field. The precession goes around in an ice cream uh, cone shape around 45 megahertz for hydrogen protons in a, in a magnetic field strength of 1 tesla. At a certain moment, a proton pointing in one direction, so let's say we have this A here, and another proton pointing exactly opposite direction, A prime. This opposing directions cancel each other out. Given that there are more protons pointing up than down, we are left with some protons pointing up, which is the spin excess illustrated here. In general, we end up with a magnetic vector in the direction of the external magnetic field or along the longitudinal Z direction. This is called the longitudinal magnetization. Thus, in a strong external magnetic field, a new magnetic vector is induced in the patient who becomes a magnet himself or herself. However, because it is longitudinal or along the B0, it cannot be measured directly. The transverse component here, so this one, uh, refers to the xy components and the vector sum here is 0. So after we put the patient into uh, the magnet, we send in radio waves. So we have this RF pulse. This is just a short verse of some electromagnetic waves. So that's why we call this one RF or radio frequency pulse. Its function is mainly to disturb the protons that peacefully process along the or along with the external magnetic field. This energy exchange is possible when protons and the RF pulse uh, have the same frequency. Some of the protons are lifted to a higher level as illustrated here. And in effect, the magnetization along the Z axis decreases as the protons pointing down now uh, neutralizes the same number of protons pointing up. Given that the net magnetization vector is rotating at the Larmor frequency, we can conveniently visualize the magnetization vector in a reference frame or a rotating reference frame at the Larmor frequency. We can express the rotated coordinate system as x prime, y prime, and z prime, which is just the same with the laboratory uh, RF or reference frame. Note that in a laboratory reference frame, the magnetic moment is the one rotating, while in the rotating reference frame, the transverse magnetization or the x prime and the y prime is rotating at the Larmor frequency. Now, we can discuss magnetic resonance using the following steps. So first, an RF pulse is applied along the transverse plane. So that's the X prime and the Y prime and can be denoted as V sub 1. So this one. The net transverse magnetization uh, appears at Y prime as we apply V1 along the X prime. When we turn off the transmission RF coil, we can detect a signal called the free induction decay or FID using the receiver RF coil. Note that this type of RF pulse is called 90 degrees uh, or 90 degree RF since we flip the uh, this one, the longitudinal magnetization vector on the transverse plane. So that's this alpha here is equal to 90 degrees or this is or, uh, orthogonal to the external field B0. Last step is relaxation, or this is where the net magnetization returns back to the initial state as shown here. I have said earlier that uh, FID arises from the action of 90 degree pulse, but an FID will be created also by an RF pulse of other flip angles aside from 90 degrees because some component of longitudinal magnetization is always steep into transverse plane. The FID 
is just one of the four basic types of NMR signals produced in different methods. Other MR signals include the gradient echo, spin echo, and stimulated echo, but I will not discuss it here. In the year 1946, Felix Bloch published a mathematical analysis of nuclear induction. Part of it are the Bloch equations, which is a set of macroscopic equations used to calculate nuclear magnetization m sub x, m sub y, m sub z as a function of time given the relaxation times T1 and T2. So I will discuss it here um, briefly. T1 is related to the regrowth of longitudinal magnetization M sub Z, while T2 is related to the decay of the transverse component MXY. T1 results from thermal agitation or the spin lattice, while T2 is from internuclear action or the spin spin or this is uh, the spins of your protons. The T1 therefore represents the time required for MZ uh, to regrowth about 63% of its initial value. Similarly, the T2 represents the time required for the M sub X or M sub Y to decay down to about 37% of their initial maximum values. Okay, so in summary, MRI is a non-invasive medical imaging modality that has relatively high spatial resolution with various soft tissue contrasts. Protons process uh, along the field lines of the magnetic field. The precession frequency that we described earlier can be calculated uh, using this equation, which is called the Larmor frequency. Antiparallel and parallel protons can cancel each other out. And RF pulse causes longitudinal magnetization to decrease and establishes a new transverse magnetization. So last, the relaxation time constants, T1 and T2, that we discussed here, are tissue-specific and sources of image contrast for an MRI image. So that's it for this lecture. Thank you. Hi! If you have learned something in this video and you like my content, please consider subscribing my YouTube channel, GP Academia. See you in the next video.